Well, thank you so much. Um, and I'm so delighted today that Tony Towns Whitley has, has joined us for a discussion that I think she's uniquely suited for at this event. Um, Tony Towns Whitley, as you all know, uh, serves as CEO of SAIC. And so in terms of where she sits now, working for a company that has for so long been such a major player in the defense space, has been a private sector partner to DOD, uh, but also because of where she's been. Many of you would have known her from uh, her role at Microsoft, where she serves as, served as president previously for US regulated industries. You've worked at a major defense company, or you, you currently lead a major defense company. You've worked at a major tech company. Um, you've driven so much innovation and entrepreneurship on both sides of that coin. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. It's, this is a great setup, by the way. Uh, my first time, I know last year was the inaugural, mm -hmm. but you know, I, there's something in a name here, and I think you've caught, caught something here on this sort of national security innovation. Oh, I thought you meant Ronald Reagan. With that too. <laughs> uh, clearly, we knew that name. We knew that name. But what we're talking about now is almost the sort of 2.0 of the DIB. We keep talking about the DIB, I think, in anachronistic terms, often, of the defense industrial base. This, to me, is maybe the turn of the corner on the expansion of that base, the renaming, or maybe leveraging that base as more of a portfolio to address some of the issues, and we'll get into that. But I, I really have appreciated this event, and that's uh, not to be solicitous here, but uh, I really do think this is about the proximity uh, and the right mix of individuals that can actually lean in. Well, thank you. With that compliment, all the questions will now be softballs. That's so. right. Wow. And that was actually my, that was my intent. I think we've, we've, we've arrived then. No, we've that's, arrived. that's squarely what we, we tried to achieve with the event. We didn't make up the term national security innovation base. It comes from the national security sure. strategy. We've worked with Nadia Shadlow mm -hmm. and so many others who, who really drove that, that strategy and incorporated that term, which, which we've adopted, as so many of you have, to really understand this ecosystem. Yeah. And as we think about innovation and as, as we've talked about it here on stage today, you know, a lot of people are going to think in terms of companies, those, those smaller kind of tech startups, dual use, commercial sector uh, companies with defense relevance, and they're, they're important players in this yeah. ecosystem. We've had many on stage today. But there's also innovation happening, as you know, from not only the technology community uh, uh, in that sense, but, but from, from the defense industrial base. How do, you, how do you think about innovation from where you sit and where you've sat? Yeah, it's been interesting. I'm six months in the role. and. Um uh, because of where I came from, a lot of impressions of what, what's going to happen to SAIC. Somehow we're becoming a hyperscaler overnight or something because I came out of Microsoft. But I will tell you, it's been interesting to watch and to understand how innovation is talked about, um, particularly from the various vantage points. I, I still believe we're still a bit narrow in our definition. When I think about innovation, we have an audience that speaks to sort of the what, what's being built and the new capabilities that can change, change the scenario, change the environment. I think there's a set of individuals that focus on business model innovation and how things are delivered, how they're integrated, uh, what DevSecOps looks like, how we, how we sort of integrate on the ground real time mission. And then I think there's a, I would say even to attract some of the talent uh, as I spend some time at universities and I get to be a visiting professor, uh, Arun lets me visit the folks from Stanford, not often because of what I say, but uh, yeah. from time to time I get to go back to my own alma mater and talk to some fairly cranky computer scientists uh, at Princeton. What I'm finding is this idea of applied innovation is what they're thinking about. The idea of going from build innovation to applied innovation and what the public sector is requires and, and ha what they're trying to almost get over the transom is how do I take my build innovation passion and get into an applied innovation environment? And that, I think, can attract even new players, if you will, and new talent from some of these universities. So the way we talk about innovation, I think we have to broaden mm -hmm. a bit our aperture of what we're saying and, and be clear uh, what types of innovation we're talking about. And I, I think we also have to attack a couple, some folklore that's been built up over years. We talk about, it was interesting, when I left Microsoft and I came to SAIC, um, I remember when I joined Microsoft in 2015, we were called old tech. I left Microsoft, we were new tech. I joined SAIC, we're old dib. Uh, you know, my hope is we're new dib. I mean, at some point, uh, we just have to kind of think about the fact that across the industrial base, innovation is happening at every level. You know, if you looked at it as a portfolio, there's the venture community, there's the private, equi private equity community, there's integrators that are trying to figure out what's the 2.0 role for next system, system integrators. There are primes, and, and if you will, the, there are those who are building vertically and fully integrated solutions. All of them are in many ways 
trying to innovate. Mm -hmm. We have an innovation fund at SAIC. I think most people wouldn't even think when I hired my, my chief innovation officer, I snagged Lauren Knossenberger out of the Air Force CIO role, and her first question was, and this is our new innovation officer, we have an innovation fund. It was a little concerning <laughs> at the first, it's like, you are the innovation officer, but this is how we bring on, and the reason that's important is so much of what we've heard in your report card outlines is that if we really juiced the actual infrastructure, excuse me, the actual base, this industrial base, it's not about just more money. It's flexibility and the ability for companies that are mid-size to bring some of these small companies and some of these ventures and startups mm -hmm. across that valley of death. Mm -hmm. And we're doing it every day. I just don't think we actually have some visuals on, on how that's happening. Where do you see the biggest challenges in doing that? The report card delivers, delivers some low some grades. We were talking grades. about that earlier. Where do you see the challenges to building those bridges, to doing that integration that, that is trying to, well, look, the as is a, trying to pursue? As a former gifted and talented teacher in Fairfax County, just giving an F, I just want to commend you. That's a super hard thing to do. Uh, <laughs> super hard. Because look, let's just be, let's get realistic about uh, what we're seeing. So I think that brings a lot of credibility. Look, what we know the government is looking for a combination of solvency, um, security, and scalability. On our end, we sit in the mission space. We embed technology and integration and science and engineering, and we have a view to what these companies, whether at almost every stage, what they're looking for. And I, I could probably boil it down to there's, a, there's capital and capital infusion to get through certain phases. There's coaching, absolute coaching that has to occur. And then there's some coherence, the coherence of what we, if you live in this world, you understand that DOD wants to be data centric, but the policies are often net centric. They're not, so if you're a small company or you're a startup, that coherence is not there. You have to have companies that can help you understand or partners that can help you understand how to get through that. I think we have found, you know, I was excited, we've been doing some, some work with a, a, a venture partner of ours, uh, Zage, which is a basically zero trust architecture capability, and you know, just the ability to help them get through these pivotal moments, we're learning along the way. It's changing our own process. There's a little bit of reverse engineering that happens when you start to engage with the venture community. But I would suggest to you that the biggest challenges are signals. Hmm. We, lack of clear signal from a customer, if you will, from the government. Uh, lack of the, gus the government's ability to even give you a clear funding signal so you understand what should be in your IRAD, the fact that Companies like my, my company and many that are in the room, we're having to make bets. We're doing, if you will, we're, we're making bets ahead of the curve. And that's okay. We've all, got we've all got shareholders. We've all got boards. We all have to explain those bets. We're willing to make those bets. But the timing of the bet, the return on the bet, the consistency of the narrative, all of that are signals. Counter UAS, perfect example, right? Mm -hmm. Top priority for the Department of Defense, one of the top ones. The signal has been mixed on what's the acquisition strategy? What's, how do we go from a capabilities office to a true fully program? How, what does that look like? For a company like SAIC that is positioned in this space, and not only in the DOD side, what that might even mean for like a Homeland Security or CBP on the border, what that would mean for that kind of capability, you, you gotta have clear signal. And in the public, if you're a publicly traded company, which I think, become, you know, condolences to all of us that are here, on the publicly <laughs> traded side, that signal has to be translated into a financial model. And I think we are struggling with signal. I don't think we're struggling with funding. I don't, uh, look, of course, funding from the perspective of a clear funding signal, not more funding, but clear signal on funding and flexibility. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's where I think you, we do realize some of the lowest grades in, in, in the report card in the assessment. Another uh, lower scoring uh, aspect of our assessment was on the talent piece, yeah, yeah. the talent base, the, our workforce. It's not to say that we're not, we don't have some of the best and brightest minds in the world here yes. in our country, whether they're American born or foreign born, coming here to study at our universities in STEM, even bringing uh, workers up through the skilled trades. How does, how, how, how does industry think about workforce challenges? Uh, how do you see um, you know, those challenges in, in whether it's attracting talent, training yeah. talent, retaining talent, and what are you all doing to overcome it or what more do you need from government to, yeah. to help? Well, look, I think you heard a great conversation. Undersecretary Shu just sort of named it. Look, we, yeah. both the pie is not as, as sufficient as it needs to be at the national level, and then we're all, we're all competing for some of the same, same talent. Uh, you know, 
you tend to have your talent, your critical talent tends to follow where your company or your organization is trying to differentiate. And so when we're all trying to differentiate in AI or data security or, 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 or if you will, cloud, we're all kind of going after some of the same. I go back to this idea that uh, first, applied innovation. We have to get people excited, students excited. I say this as a, as a former teacher. Getting students excited at much younger ages about applied, not just the build, but the application of innovation. It is a different skill set, and we need to get them excited. Look at down in Huntsville, the Alabama School of Cyber and Technology, taking high schoolers from every county of Alabama, two from a county. One of the most diverse schools I've ever seen. They do a three-year high school curriculum. They get their security clearance sophomore year, and they start working senior year. And they start working in Huntsville, in this sector, in the environment. We need models like that at that age, at that stage. The second answer to that is uh, something that uh, my, my friend Arun Gupta and I have been talking about are triple threat players. And we say that with a little sports excitement for those of us who play basketball. Mm -hmm. Arun thinks he does. I actually have played. But, <laughs> but this sort of uh, you know shoot, dribble, pass. Triple threat players, it has to be cool to come out of your institution, your university, and do a round in the public sector, in the private sector, in the nonprofit world. Like the idea, when I came out as a Peace Corps volunteer, it was about service. And people thought that would hold back your career. In fact, it actually catapulted my career. Many of you have had military service. People think maybe that held it catapulted. We don't have a catapult signal to our students coming out that says it's OK. Many of them are purpose driven. They want to make a difference in the public sector, but they think it's a trade off. It's an either or. And as long as we have it as binary, you're going to see some phenomenal talent move out of the government and not think that it is part of their career path. So that's a message we're trying to get through is triple threat means go ahead and operate. And in fact, you get better in every sector by having worked in the last one. So that's, mm -hmm. that's one area I think we've got to do. Government can help us tell that story. OK. A, a little basketball analogy during, during March Madness. There um, we go. Let's take a question from the audience before we end the session. We've got mics here. Any audience questions? So oh, boy. Well, I'd love to jump They're in with so one polite. final one of my own. I wanted to end kind of on a broad note. Yeah. You know, industry, again, back to your time at, at, in the tech sector, you think a lot about national challenges. We've talked about some of, some of those today, the, the talent piece, the, the demand signal. What do you see as the biggest, the biggest national challenges that you're trying to help solve? So look, as part of building our strategy, you know, I'm six months in and we've been building a sort of a growth strategy for our company. But part of that was the, the articulation of where was our company going to stand as it relates to national imperatives. Why? Because we're a 55-year company that was built, if, for those who know SAIC, that was built as one of the most unique models of its kind. But they kind of enjoyed being the, the gritty, on the ground, science, before tech was cool, before STEM was cool, before DARPA was known. They were there challenging the government in some of the most complex problems uh, that the government was trying to solve, particularly around national security. So to reinstill our strategy was to identify where are we going to do the long-range commitment long-term investment, differentiated technology around five key national imperatives. And you know, those that are critical probably to this conversation would be around all domain war fighting, where we've made a commitment, undersea dominance, where we make a commitment. Yes, we are part of the reinstitution of the Mark 48 under, you know, uh, torpedo, as well as what's become Mark 710 for the Navy. But this undersea dominance component, next generation space, where we are all over this conversation around space domain and space trafficking air trafficking. And so I think that the, the thing that was interesting, I've talked now to four, I won't mention which political figures, uh, but four political figures, very senior political figures, as well as the, the Secretary of Defense. And it was interesting to hear their reaction that companies need to commit. The government is also looking for signal that we are willing to commit to long-term national imperatives. And whether that's the ethos of the company or whether this is what helps you retain your talent or you have a very mission-oriented company, we've got to, and don't hurt yourself, we, uh, well, you're the cameraman, you can hurt yourself. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing, I'm just teasing. Get a great picture. But we've got to commit to imperatives that are national imperatives that are not just company imperatives. And you start talking about when the government sees that we can get past our proprietary dramas that we have within industries where we will sell things that we know the government doesn't quite need. We're not always on next gen, where we all have our challenge with direct labor, all the things that happen to our industry. 
is there something that ascends beyond that, that we're willing to come together? Mm -hmm. And there's no way we're going to address these national imperatives as one company. This isn't about an SAIC market share. It's about who's with us as we start talking about all domain war fighting, and who's going to show up in Indopec to, to really, and look, that's a number of different companies. It requires us to build an innovation ecosystem. And that's our way of sort of spurring our company on to say, what do we believe in? What's our ethos? What's our purpose? And how are we going to be here for the next 20 years doing that work? You can tell she's good because she left me 10 seconds before the end of no the session. No hard question. Four seconds, simply, three. <laughs> uh, simply to say thank you. A, a great conversation, I think, I think, pulling on a lot of the threads that we've heard from today and, and a good charge, I think, there at the end in terms yeah. of the demand signal uh, that the uh, partners in the private sector are sending to government um, that I think we can all take with us as well. Please join me in thanking thank Tony Tony. Thank you so much.